Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 849. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is April 5th, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. As you're going to hear by sounds in the background, I'm no longer in Florida. I'm on the road. Sasquatch, Jill, Kevin, I've taken up the the trek off to Arkansas to go see the eclipse. And so we're, we're parked now somewhere outside of Birmingham next to a train track and a fire department. So at some point, you may hear things that sound familiar to you. Before we get too far into the episode, please like this program on Facebook or YouTube. You see that thumb, you you click on the thumbs up. If you've not subscribed yet, and 28% of you have not subscribed, according to Google, I want you to click that subscribe rectangle, up pops the bell, and I want you to click that bell, and you will be instantly notified. And I mean instantly notified every time I upload a new episode of Anglican Unscripted. George, people are going, where did they go? They just disappeared off the face of the earth. They were coming on Easter, and then I was waiting for my Easter update from Kevin and George, and they've been offline. Well, George, you're now the Bionic George. Well, what's going on? Well, on uh, Easter Monday, I had a pacemaker uh, installed in my chest, and I had this past week my first vacation since uh, 2018. Uh I've been uh, recuperating from surgery, and of course, Easter week we took off from broadcasting, Mm -hmm. and uh, so far, so good. Uh, I feel like I've been hit by a hammer in my chest, and my body's taking time to adjust to uh, the new rhythms and the new pressures and things like that, but hopefully this is the start of a good phase of life, more energy, more life. It is because the doctors set your heart at the rate that it's supposed to be. Your rate was slowing down, and you're getting tired, and now you, you have to get used to this new heart rate. And uh, it's going to take a couple weeks till you figure out that blood is flowing. That's that's blood going through my veins. So, well, good for you. And yes, because George uh, sent me an email saying, I can't record today, I got a new pacemaker, I gave him the day off. Because I'm the best boss Anglicanism ever had, right, George? Absolutely. <laughs> and I probably... <laughs> probably would have been still recuperating from anesthesia so we would have gotten in trouble if i had said stuff (laughs) yes all right well there's a lot of stories to cover because we're probably two weeks out but we're just going to do some of the bigger stories and i think the biggest story that you sent me is that uh pope francis will announce a new document on april 8th that will give a statement on gender ideology on part of the Catholic Church. Now, this is interesting because we're in the the queer gender war right now. And I want to see how the the Catholic Church takes us up uh, as far as how the queer community can uh, participate within the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, you, um, You may ask yourself, well, why is Anglican unscripted talking about a Catholic document? Well, when the Catholic Church catches a cold, the uh, Anglican world gets the flu. So, this document, which I've not seen, nobody has seen it, well, I'm sure people have seen it, but it's not been out of there in the press, is going to be called, it's going to be called Dignitas Infinita. And it's going to address gen, uh, gender ideology. Dignity and forever? What, what does, uh, what's your the say? Dignity of man, uh, infinite dignity. Okay. And, um, and so the guesses are, this is going to be along the same lines of the trajectory that we've seen in all of Francis's documents. Now, um, the expectations are that this will talk about transgenderism, bi- uh, bisexuality. It will may look at some of the nitty gritty. Can bisexuals uh, be baptized or all this and that? I have no idea. So I'll, I'll say little about this because I know little. But the rumors and some of the contacts I made when I studied in Rome last year telling me that they're expecting an earthquake of sorts. Not that this will change the world in and of itself, but this is part of a trajectory. If we follow where Francis has gone and where he's been, um, you know, just past few years we had in 2019 the Abu Dhabi Declaration, Mm -hmm. where Francis met with uh, 
Muhammad al Tayyib, the Grand Mufti of Al Azhar in Cairo, and they produced a document. And one of the lines said, the pluralism and diversity for religions, colors, sex, race, and language are willed by God and his wisdom. So Francis well, signed a document that said that plurality of religion is willed by God. Mm -hmm. So does that, is that mean that the only way to the Father is through the Son, not according to the Abu Dhabi Declaration, because God willed the creation of Muslims and Hindus and this and that and the other? Well, uh, the Abu Dhabi, doc Abu Dhabi document infers that Jesus lied when Jesus said, I'm the only way to the Father. And so I, it's going to be interesting to see the follow-up document. Well, 2020, next year, we had Fratelli Tutti, which was issued after the Amazon Synod, which where the, where the Amazon Synod and the, this document said, we all live in a common earth, a common home, the earth, and we all must take concrete actions to restore the world and overcome the ills by health and economic, social and anthropological, all these crises. And that produced the Pachamama, which was the uh, pagan goddess that uh, some people politely called a Amazonian uh, Mary, Virgin Mary, but no, it wasn't. It was a pagan goddess uh, that was uh, celebrated in front of the Vatican. And then Vatican traditionalists threw it in the Tiber. And so we had uh, another example of, this was Francis as being out there, sort of Gaia or earth worship. Last December 8th, we have the Ducia Supplicans on the Pastoral Meaning of Blessings, which of course, Francis uh, approved gay blessings. And now are we going to see, what are we gonna see on Monday? Now, where I'm coming from all this is that we're following a trajectory here. And if I would paint a, paint a name to it, it's the Revenge of Tallard de Chardin. If you remember this from your studies years ago, he was the fellow uh, Jesuit who died in the 50s who talked about the cosmic Christ and everything is evolutionary, everything is the sum of the path, past, nothing is comprehensible except through history. Nature is the equivalent of becoming self-creation. Um, there is nothing, Teilhard, that wrote, not even the human soul, the highest spiritual manifestation we know of, that does not come with this universal law. So God is a, created the cosmos, and man is just another little bit of this cosmos. Um, this is dangerous thinking, but it is where Francis is coming out. Teilhard was a Jesuit. Francis is a Jesuit. I don't know if there's any link there. But this is, you know, Tellyard was a supporter of eugenics and social Darwinism. He was uh, believed in the superiority of some races due right. to evolution. Right. And this is the same thinking that produced Margaret Sanger and the abortion movement. Um, are we going to see the Catholic Church give up on abortion? Are we going to see it give up on the uniqueness of man as God's special creation? Or are we just going to be, you know, like Richard Dawkins and say, or that Princeton uh, philosopher that says, you know, a monkey is no great better than a human being, or a human being is no better than a monkey. Well, you said the Roman Ca when the Roman Catholic Church gets a cold, the rest of the, the uh, church gets the flu. I would say the rest of the church is going to get cancer because we've always looked at the Roman Catholic Church as a solid uh, place that does not change doctrine uh, as much over time. Uh, that doesn't. Uh, fall to the winds of where the wind is blowing today. They don't have uh, the effects of zeitgeist taking over their uh, uh, diocese and leadership. However, in the last 12, 15 years, we have seen that. And it's scary to watch the Roman Catholic Church lean now in, uh, with the wind, when before they were kind of a stalwart. They were a cornerstone that you said, you know, if the Catholics can stay together, that gives me hope. Well, I'm starting to lose hope because the Roman Catholics are, are slowly writing into their doctrine and discipline uh, how to become fashionable with zeitgeist. The, the fellows I met in Rome uh, who were Vatican-based, um, 
Catholic clergy are great gossips. I have to tell you, we think Episcopalians are bad. Catholics <laughs> no. are much worse. <laughs> yes, they are. And sort of my question to well, where is this all headed? You know, we've got the short term, worst case scenario, we'll see bisexuals and transgenderism. We'll have a strange new respect for them. Um, there's something at work within the bowels of the Vatican being produced uh, by Cardinal Fernandez's team about uh, the universe where uh, we need, you know, we're going to have documents on aliens, you know, and, you know, we're, we're really headed down the, you know, I joke, in my church, the Episcopal church, we have four uh, A, B, C, and D versions of the Eucharistic Rite 2. Yes. And what we do in this church is every year we go from A to B, B to C, C to D. This is your C. So every Sunday I say, I do the Star Trek prayer. The planets in their courses, is this earth, our island home. Yep. And we all snigger slightly, <laughs> but, you know, it was written in the 70s. But, man, let's just take that theology and just go crazy with it. And that's what's being worked on today. Uh, the transgender stuff and the homosexual stuff, that's all already been decided, uh, I'm told. And it's just a question of getting the peasants accustomed to it until they basically go all heavy and hard into it. But the work now today is, is man unique? Is, is, you know, and this comes to, is, you know, we say Jesus was fully human, fully divine. Well, what if there were multiple Jesuses? What if yeah. there was a Jesus and Romulus for, or Star yeah, Trek? For every alien race out there. Every but, alien race there was. But that's the multiple problem. Multiple sons of God. You know, we've watched this over time where, uh, you know, 12 years ago, it was the Gospel of John Lennon. And we're slowly mm -hmm. getting into the Gospel of Carl Sagan. With billions and billions of planets, how important could man really be? And that's what the church is doing right now. It's like, we're just little specks in God's big camera. And hopefully he doesn't take a lens cleaner and wipe us off. And now, we, Well, we do have viewers who deny everything we say when we <laughs> re raise issues of concern about the Catholic Church. That, no, the church yeah. doesn't change. No, yeah. this and that. Well, I'm not going to fight with you over this. I'm just repeating what I've been told and observing what I observe. And well, I no, hope it's, it's not going to come true. But hold on, if the, the Roman Catholic Church wasn't going to change and has never changed, then what are the conservative Roman Catholics doing on the internet freaking out? You know, of course it's changing because you're watching, you know, a large portion of their uh, Orthodox conservative base go through conniption fits that Anglicans did 10 years ago. You know, so it's changing and that's you can see it's changing by uh, what the conservatives are saying let's move on into our next story it's a uh, uh, brett murphy from the church of england he actually he moved on to the free church now he was on our program about a month or two ago when i did an interview with him about being held for trial for misconduct for misgendering rachel mann who is a man uh, who is a, uh, a person who decided to cut off their genitals and call themselves a woman. And he said that there'd be a dude. And he got in trouble, George. Um, this is about Brett Murphy, but it's also a bigger issue. Brett yes. Murphy was brought up on charges while he was on the way out of the Church of England for uh, conduct on becoming a member of a clergy by misgendering a transvestite. Rachel Mann is an archdeacon in Birmingham or Manchester, one of those places, and is also a poetess uh, or poet. Poet. Uh, and is really out there, theologically speaking, um, is really into the Gnostic sort of stuff. Well, uh, Brett uh, ridiculed this person uh, and was brought up on charges by activists who said, you can't misgender a person and the charges were dismissed. Well, this was appealed by transgender and feminist activists, which I really don't understand the linkage between the two because one seeks to get rid of the other, but okay. that's a different topic. Okay, um, enemy of my enemy is my enemy, come on. Uh, well, they, so they uh, appealed this and Brett by this time was out of the Church of England mm -hmm. and the bishop overseeing, the board overseeing this said no, he may have been rude, he may have been insensitive, but that is not grounds for uh, 
action. And, you know, what does it matter for Brett? He's already left the Church of England. Well, what it matters is that if he had been found guilty, even in absentia, that would have created the precedent that you that the tra- you may not misgender somebody such that transgenderism is now the legal law of the land in the Church of England. Well, Fortunately, no, that was avoided. It was big. It's, I think it's bigger than that. Who's misgendering? Is Rachel Mann misgendering his body? Or did Brett Murphy misgender? And here, the bishop is saying, I don't think, you know, maybe he didn't misgender him. Maybe this is a bigger doctrinal issue coming out where uh, you can't misgender a person who cut off their genitals, George. Well, so the scientific world will tell us that down to the molecular level, yeah. you are male or female. Chromosome. You yeah. may take a sandblaster and remove the external uh, bits, but biologically, you are a male or a female. Mm-hmm. Now, yes, of course, there's one in one one hundredth of a person born with birth defects or there's yeah. something. I'm not we're not talking about it. we're talking about the overwhelming vast majority of male and female. He created them and you can't switch from one to another. Now, you can call yourself a different thing, but there's it's, it's a scientific impossibility to change genders or change sexes and. This comes just as the Scotland has introduced a law that will jail you for, up, I think, up to seven years if you on social media you call Rachel Mann a man. Um, now, it, this law has been given a, a, basically a thwacking on its first day by J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author, who is a very strong feminist but is a traditional feminist. She doesn't believe transvestites, transgender people are real women. And, but hold on, she's one of the few feminists that's brave enough to speak out as well, George. I mean, there are well, plenty of got, feminists that bl- believe what J.K. Rowling does, but they're afraid to be canceled. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's it's. I find it ridiculous where, like, Daniel Radcliffe, the, the little tiny fellow who played Harry Potter, is so petrified of the feminist transgender lobby that he has right. to mouth the platitudes and denounce the woman who made his career and made him a multimillionaire, yeah. he can denounce her with absolute killer conscience because it'll protect his career. Um, the, uh, the ability to believe a lie that is being fostered in our society about this and other issues is just incredible. And I just thank God that somebody in the hierarchy of the Church of England had the sense not to go long to get along to the destruction of our culture and society and our people we're denying but basic basic truths we well we've redefined what truth is i mean mm-hmm. the bigger problem here is not uh rachel me and the, the bigger problem is we've redefined what a woman is we've redefined what a man is to the point where we have undefined what they are and you cannot in e- any uh liberal social circle uh confidently describe what a woman is or define what a man is without getting in trouble they said oh that's not it i mean I, I watch these interviews all the time on youtube with a conservative with a microphone goes on a college campus and says what is a woman oh i don't i, I don't think i want to answer that <laughs> why not that's a simple question you know we can a- answer that with just two chromosomes and they just they're afraid now, and we've co- created a culture of uh, kids who are entitled and afraid. Jordan Peterson, the well-known thinker, um, writer, psychologist from Canada, mm-hmm. sort of hit the world radar when he, because uh, he's a tenured professor at the University of Toronto at the time, he refused to be compelled to address people by their assumed Gender. identity. Yeah. Yeah. In other words... His point was, you can be whatever you want to be, you know, it's up to you, but you cannot compel me to play along or to speak, you know, falsehoods against my own will. And we now live in a society where we are compelled by social pressure, and in some case laws in Scotland, to lie. We're compelled to speak the falsehoods and the untruths. 
you're pretending I don't want to pretend. Can I not pretend, please? And no, you're not allowed not to pretend. And, you know, that's what you know, I've identified them here on the program many times as generation cosplay. And uh, they want to force that upon us. And we're watching that inside and outside the church. George, let's move on to our next story. Oh, did we mention Brett Murphy was found not guilty, right? Yes, we did. We talked that story to death. I want to be sure we covered the most uh, important part. The, uh, the appeal was rejected. Okay, so uh, Bristol Cathedral host Iftar meal last night. And if you don't know what Iftar is, that's when the Muslims break fast from Ramadan. And it was held in a uh, Church of England cathedral. Wow. I'm sure they don't pray to Allah or anything during that. Well, Iftar. it's the evening meal before the Adnan or the call to prayer of the right. Maghrib. You know, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. That's right. Now, did they allow the prayer to be said in the cathedral at the conclusion of the meal? I don't know. I wasn't there. Okay. Now, it's, people will say, oh, it's just being neighborly and nice. Well, the problem is you cannot take this out of the context of what's going on in Britain. You had uh, Westminster Abbey flying the Pakistani flag from its battlements on Pakistan Independence Day. Like they did I've with the American flag. The I've never seen the 4th of July, the American flag, flown from Westminster Abbey. Nope. <laughs> you saw King's Cross, the I think one of the major London rail terminus is the Ramadan prayers on the announcement boards. Uh, no, we didn't see Easter prayers or Diwali prayers or Hindu, you know, we don't see anything but Muslim prayers. There's an aggressiveness by the Muslim minority in England that is now we're either going to see the collapse of English cultural self-confidence and they become dimmies, meaning uh, subject people to a Muslim aggressor and invader, or we're going to see this stamp down. I don't think um, the, the liberal left's accommodation of extremist Islam has reached the point where it is killing the English nation. Um, okay. Rewind our clocks. 2008, was it? Roland Williams said that maybe uh, England would have to, inter or the UK would have to introduce laws that allowed for Sharia to be enforced in certain segments of UK uh, parlance. Remember that? Mm -hmm. I interviewed um, N.T. Wright right after that, and he said, I don't know why he said that. He doesn't mean it. He, N.T. Wright says he couldn't possibly mean that. You know, but Williams is a bit of a fuzzy person on some yes. issues. Uh, pacifist, you know, pacifist, uh, socialist, vegan, sandal wearing, weird beard with bad teeth and a big beard. You missed you know, Druid. I may like the his Druid. theology books, but I don't really follow his political advice. Yeah. You know, I think that was well meant. Oh, well, let the Muslims do the little things. After all, we've let the Jews do their things for 2,000 years, and there's no problem. Well, there's a big problem between, there's a big difference between Islam, an aggressive, mm -hmm. hostile religion that seeks to kill or destroy its neighbors who are not of their faith, and Judaism. There's a major difference. Um, and, you know, the the nonsense that Britain has allowed to come up with is just incredible. I don't see I, I just can't see how it can be allowed to continue other oh, people are going to leave the country uh or they're going to take their country back i don't think they can because you know there it's no longer just a small minority of uh, uh muslims in the country george no, well I, the, the, it's it, the, here's, here's something um i saw a little thing on uh, uh in a news item about representation of minorities in British uh, commercials. 37% mm -hmm. of actors in British commercials are non-white or black. That's 10 times yeah. their proportion in society. Only three and a half percent are non-white. So what we're, and same with Muslims. Muslims are nowhere near a majority in any of us. Some neighborhoods, Tower Hamlets, parts of Bradford, may have Muslim majorities, but they're little ghettos or Ben Lus like the French have, places where they're all concentrated. 
Um, yet the media, the, the, the TikTok world, the social world, the BBC <clears throat> portrays that it's like in the United States. Every time I see a commercial, it's a mixed race couple. Absolutely. Uh, at, they're going to run out of mixed race children after a while to spread <laughs> around these commercials because there are only so many of them. Yeah. And, you know, what proportion of couples are mixed race? It's very, very low. Very small, yeah. And, you know, we know they're lying to us. We know this is not a representation of reality. But, you know, hey, we close our eyes and go, hey, well, you know, if they want to sell their product that way, good for them. I'm not going to buy it, or I don't care if I buy it or not. Um, but again, we live in a world where lies are now foundational. They're not yep. representative of reality around us. Well, wasn't it? Alexander Skos, uh, what's his name? Skoskinson said, we know they are lying. They know they're lying. We know that, uh, uh, let me pull it up real quick here. We know Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Yeah, I can't pronounce names. You know that. We know that they are lying. They know that they are lying. They even know that we know they are lying. We also know that they know we are uh, know that they are lying too. And that is something that's you know everybody knows it's a lie, but it must continue. Well, it's like describing the Church of England. We yes, know yes. Justin Welby's lying. <laughs> Justin Welby knows that we know he's uh, lying. He's lying. Yeah. And we just all pretend. Uh, all right. Back to the notes. All right. Uh, oh, I didn't get a chance to read it, but you talked about it in the pre-show here. There was an Easter hit piece uh, on Calvin Robinson, a person I did an interview with and who's made a lot of news uh, since mere Anglicanism uh, that was held here in Charleston. And Alan Rushbridger, former editor of The Garden, wrote a nasty piece about Calvin. Let's talk about that a little bit. He's now a, a president or dean or provost of an Oxford college. I think Lady Margaret Hall, one of the former women's colleges. Mm -hmm. Well, Royce Berger wrote uh, an article for Prospect magazine that was also published in The Dependent, Independent, painting Calvin Robinson as a hate preacher. And in English journalism, those are phrases used for some of these Muslims extremists. There's a fellow with his hook that was deported. You know, he didn't have Andy had a hook. You know, really nasty pieces of work. Uh, and, and I won't go into all of Roisberger's charges other than to say it's pure hysteria, nonsense, and it's not journalism. It's just this fellow unloading on Calvin Robinson. Now, we're not going to debunk all of that, you know, other people, Calvin can do that. Yeah. Uh, needless to say, this is a hit piece and is not worth uh, considering seriously. But the question is, why does the, they've brought out the biggest of big guns, an Oxford college master who's a former editor of The Guardian, seeking to destroy Calvin Robinson. But if you can take why? down, oh, hold on, but if you can take down Calvin Robinson, you can take down a lot of people. The, the biggest goal now that we can see in the media is to compare every Christian to uh, Fred Phelps from Westbury Baptist, you know, the, the hate groups uh, that were very popular uh, uh, 10 and 15 years ago that would say uh, uh, fags are going to hell and God hates fags. And to, to paint all Christians in that corner has been the goal. We watch the BBC all the time. Uh, they don't ha ever have a normal Christian on their program. Everybody on there is either uh, a liberal, uh, I just want to pick and choose the Bible parts I like, or they're the Fred uh, Phelps out there. And, you know, they, they help the BBC paint Christian and Christian Christians and Christianity into a little corner. Well, for me, yes, I, th I agree with you completely, Kevin, but I still think it's significant who the person they chose to focus on. Sure. Who is that evil person? There are a lot of people they could have picked, the rector of St. Helens, Bishop Gates, you know, there are a lot of major C of E clergy types, you know, from uh, uh, Ricky, uh, Nicky Gumbel. Yeah, on, Alpha. On down. That they could have used this degree of invective and uh, hate. And it's Calvin Robinson they've chosen, who's in his 30s, uh, who's... Um, not even in the Church of England. He uh, serves in a free Church of England parish and is a priest of the Nordic Catholic Church. 
But wow. what's unique about Kelvin is the skin color. You know, if you can take out a conservative um, uh, minority, you're doing really good for the BBC. That's like that's their goal. We can't have somebody uh, uh, with his popularity and uh, his eloquence of speech and his color uh, coming against the the zeitgeist that we have here at the BBC. And I think that's that's what what they're going for, George. All righty, let's move on to story number uh -oh. five. The Episcopal Church announces four names to be the next presiding bishop. And I'm looking at the list here, and I can see that Catherine Jeffert Shorey has still left a bad taste in their mouth because they have not listed any women to be the next presiding bishop, George. Let's talk about Scott, Daniel, Sean, and Robert. Four nominees, Scott Barker of Nebraska, Daniel mm -hmm. Gutierrez of Pennsylvania, uh, Sean Rowe of Northwest Pennsylvania, and Robert Wright of Atlanta. Now we do have the uh, representation business. Robert Wright is black. Daniel Gutierrez is Hispanic of Mexican American origin. Um, they're all revisionists, but uh, it, to varying degrees, they're all accommodating revisionists. Now, what does that mean? They support the gay agenda. They're not going to rock that boat, but they're willing to live and let live with their conservative brethren. We see uh, the forthcoming general convention is going to have some uh, no real action on gay marriage other than agree to allow people to disagree. And all four of these candidates fit that bill. Now, if I were asked to pick, I'm going to be totally what? out in the wild here. <laughs> okay, yeah. Scott Barker's from Nebraska. I don't need to say anything else. No, Nobody that's it. He, he, probably not going to win. E yeah. E e except for, uh, well, uh, Jan, uh, Sean Rowe is from Erie, and he's also overseeing uh, uh, another diocese that's in, that has without a bishop. He became the youngest bishop. In the, he was ordained at 24, and he became the youngest bishop in... Uh, like in his 20s, 30s. early 30s or something. Yeah. I have heard other people in the House of Bishops meeting basically call him an insufferable prig. Uh, I don't know him personally. Hearsay, but that's he, hearsay. Okay, that's, you know, that's hearsay, but I, I've but heard He's got same. a diocese of very few people, so he loves to be on committees and he loves to sort of be, uh, what's the phrase? Um, Correct. <laughs> right, all the time. Uh, I don't know. I don't know it all. Yeah. I know it all. Yeah. So here's somebody who's got a resume of 20 plus years being a bishop and, you know, all this and that. But I think in a closed door vote, I don't, I'm not certain based upon the people I've spoken to that he'd get the vote. Well, hold that. One, one of these candidates is from Trinity Seminary in well, Pennsylvania. Let, let me do him last because I okay, think right. he's going to be the one elected. Robert Wright is uh, an African American. He's a former Emory professor. Okay. He is, uh, had, some troubles he recently survived a uh, uh a title four complaint where he was accused of interfering with a black uh, ch episcopal charity and he's really into the uh interfaith stuff so i just think that he's not you know he's got some things that people if they want to dislike him they can pick up now, Daniel Gutierrez is an interesting fellow. He's a former Roman Catholic who came out of the Diocese of the Rio Grande and was Terry Kelshaw's canon to the, or wow. canon of the ordinary. He was sent to, he, I believe he was a Roman Catholic priest yeah. who was sent to Trinity Seminary to be Anglicanized. And he came back and was called uh, to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's had some bad bishops for a long time, Charles Benison. And that actually is my home diocese way back when. Yeah. And Gutierrez um, is not a typical Trinity graduate, but he knows the species. He knows uh, American Episcopal evangelicals, and he's comfortable with them. He not, may not be one, but he doesn't despise them as Catherine Jeffrey Shorey did. So I think Gutierrez being uh, of, an, of a minority background, he'll pick up that sort of those people inclined to vote for under DEI sections. Mm -hmm. For somebody who's proven that he's able to take a horribly divided and 
angry diocese, Pennsylvania, and just calm it down, he's been successful there. If he can do it at Pennsylvania, people might say, well, he can do it in the national church and just hold it together. There's a lot of people in the leadership of the Episcopal Church who don't think there's anything wrong with the Episcopal Church, George. Yeah, but if you've got somebody at the top who can basically silently listen, silently listen to everybody's complaints and then do nothing, uh, that keeps <laughs> the institution alive. All right. So I've, I've just... Maybe I'm just doing engaging in wishful thinking. You're maybe having hope. Some, okay, maybe this somebody's doesn't got this hope. all wrapped up, and the fellow from Nebraska uh, really is uh, a diamond in the rough. Just because he's from Nebraska, nobody's ever seen or been to Nebraska. Um, but I, I would think I would tip Gutierrez right now. Okay. Well, we never know what'll come out. No, well, we'll see what happens as we get closer to general convention. On to some ACNA news. Uh, we reported. Uh, last fall that uh, Bishop Todd Atkinson was brought up on charges and there would be a, a trial. The trial has occurred and they have found him guilty, George. Yes, the trial was done on submitted briefs and affidavits. So there was right. not actually a courtroom trial, but it was decided by the judges based on the submitted record. And Atkinson was found guilty of conduct unbecoming. It's not been specified in public what this conduct was, well, the rumor mill tells us it was sort of a form of spiritual bullying. Um, God told me. Whether he, well, he really wasn't, you could say he really wasn't properly vetted when he was brought in as a bishop uh, with his little Canadian group of churches. Now, he's been out of the ACNA effectively for a good long months, time now. Yeah. And so... We'll eventually see the transcripts of, and the, the record, and we'll be able to say it's this is the exact reason. But I've not really heard anybody say this is a travesty of justice or this is wrong. And looks like the, you know, except for the lack of transparency, looks like uh, the proper things were done. Yep. Uh, the Episcopal Church deposed uh, the Bishop of Wyoming, Paul Gordon. Uh, Paul Gordon Chandler, first name is Paul hyphen Gordon, That's was weird. deposed uh, for adultery. Mm -hmm. He's married with adult children, and he engaged in an affair with uh, one of his staff, a woman, if anybody wants to think snigger. And the Episcopal Church <coughs> excuse me. suspended him, investigated, mm -hmm. and then uh, when they found the results of the investigation, he decided not to take a trial but agreed to voluntarily renounce his orders and essentially give up his episcopal ordination now he keeps his pension and all this and that but he may not minister anymore so we've had the oh we lost you george uh -huh. oh you're back you came back <laughs> had, we've had the system work for the acna and the episcopal church somebody accused of adultery because in the past we've had episcopal bishops who were accused and credibly found guilty of adultery but because of their power and influence they skated past those charges i'm thinking of paul moore in new york one of the most famous episcopal bishops of his generation yep. was a notorious adult <clears throat> and everybody knew it but yep. we weren't going to hit paul moore yep. part of the benefits of the me too business is that the powerful at least in this area, aren't being protected. And the ACNA has had a good record of uh, getting rid of dodgy <clears throat> bishops uh, who are dodgy on moral grounds. Yes. Uh, there are one or two idiots and there are one or two heretics, but uh, on moral grounds, uh, they're okay. The, they're okay. And, you know, it, talk about putting it, uh, uh, the, putting the band back together. The, the ACNA has done well with that. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's going to be an interesting time coming up in Latrobe. So let's move on here to... What do I have on my list? Oh, Bishop Marion Buddy of Washington and Cardinal Wilton Gregory of Washington were on Face the Nation. And they uh, talked Easter about... Easter Sunday. Yeah, they talked about Biden and abortion on Easter Sunday. I didn't get to see it, but according to your notes, you can pick and choose the parts of the Bible you like. Well, the uh, it, it was 
the old ways of doing things were on display on CBS Face the Nation, where we have a Protestant and a Catholic religious leader. And of mm -hmm. course, that Protestant leader must be an Episcopal bishop. Um, seriously, seriously. I mean, this is goes back. I mean, we, we could be in the 1950s yes. uh, with, uh, you know, uh, Fulton J. Sheen on one side <laughs> and, uh, you know, whoever the, yeah. the, the Episcopal uh, talking head of the day. Uh, well, and the conversation turned to Bi Joe Biden's Catholicism and his stance on abortion. And Wilton Gregory, the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, who is very liberal, according to Catholic lights, said that Joe Biden is a cafeteria Catholic, meaning he picks and chooses those portions of the faith that he wishes to follow. And Marion Buddy, who is liberal, is a woman, and um, is pro-abortion, said, well, yes, that's a good thing uh, to pick and choose those parts of the faith that work for you. I'm summarizing her word, yeah, yeah, but words, but we had a really good uh, presentation in a positive way, meaning wasn't nasty, no yelling, no shouting, no recrimination, but we just saw a stark difference. Yeah. Uh, between, if you will, a liberal and a traditional worldview. One saying is you can't, you know, faith is not a Chinese restaurant. You'll have one from column A and one from column B. Whereas the liberal bishop saying, yes, it's okay to do that. You know, you need, you need for conscience to be your guide, which of course, Jiminy Cricket said in Pinocchio, <laughs> but also uh, is, you know, from St. Thomas Aquinas and other people. But here's what is always left out, Mary and Buddy left out, is that you have to have a well-formed conscience. If you've not been properly formed and educated, understand the Christian faith, your conscience can't be your guide because you have nothing to guide it with. But hold on, I want to back up here because on LBC on April 1st, they published an interview that they did with Richard Dawkins. And Richard Dawkins... Uh, during the interview said, listen, I am a cultural Christian. I don't believe any of the malarkey with uh, Jesus and the cross and he, did, you know, uh, saving my sins. But, you know, when push comes to shove, the part of the Bible that I like is the morality. <laughs> okay. He's a picker and chooser just like um, Biden. And uh, he has picked the morality of Christian and the, the Western Christianity here he, he sees in the church, he enjoys the freedoms of it, he enjoys how it has uh, structured certainly the, the society of Europe and here in America, and he lives under that, that freedom found in the morality of Scripture. But he doesn't believe anything else. He is picked and choose, George. Is this any oh, different and, than Biden? Yeah, and he, well, he also absolutely rejected the Islamic world. Yeah. Um, too, is they'd rather live in a Christian world than an Islamic world any day. But the difference is Dawkins is honest and Biden isn't. <laughs> Dawkins is honest when yeah. he's saying he doesn't believe that Jesus is God. Joe Biden will say and do whatever it takes and will go to Mass and mouth the words and repeat the creeds and say all the things that a good Catholic should say on these points, but then he will go and walk as far away from them as possible and negate them by his actions. No, there's a bit of a, you know, you've got to admire the Dawkins, you've got to marry, admire the Bishop of Washington for being true to what they believe. They're not faking it. Um, that's one of the things I always liked Gene Robinson as a person, because he didn't lie to you. Um, in the sense that you know where he stood, you know what he believed, what he didn't believe. He didn't shade things to try to smooth over things. And part of the problem the Church of England's for now facing is that the culture of the House of Bishops and the culture of Justin Welby is lies. You know, you know he doesn't believe this. You know he will say different things to different audiences. I've been there. I've seen him say one thing to one group and yeah. then at a different group say something totally different yeah. uh, with, you know, on the same general topic. Yeah, we he, did that when we recorded him at the Kenya National Cathedral. Yep. I mean, he he yep. did the morning service and the uh, the late service and two completely different messages because he got feedback he didn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. You know. So, you know, but 
I believe Dawkins is right. I believe that the Chris, Christianity is the foundation of our society and our culture. And the farther we move into a pagan mm -hmm. worldview, the worse our culture gets. The restraints that Christianity places on people. But, you know, as I, uh, in my Easter, one of my Easter sermons, I had a lot of Easter sermons. You know, I had a lot of them. Um, one of my Easter sermons, I said, you know, if this is just a genteel lie, um, you know, Jordan Peterson is not a Christian, uh, though his wife uh, was seen at the Catholic Church on Easter Sunday. He believes in its moral and social and ethical values, but he does not believe that Jesus is, you know, son of God and all that. It, it's clear from his writings and speaking that he does believe in God. It is not just, clear from his writing and speaking that he believes in uh, the salvation part of Christianity through Christ. Well, my message was, if you think that, then go out and play golf. It's a beautiful day. Yeah. Don't waste your time here because Christianity is not a social construct. It's the truth. Jesus died and rose from the dead. Um, and we, it's just, maybe we've always, maybe it's always been this way, but you know, we've allowed our society to basically be dictated by lies, socialized, politicalized, culturalized, you know, pick transgenderism, you know, pick, you know, the characters we see in TV ads, pick the whole George Floyd thing, pick, well, look, you know, it, let's diversity, go education, equity, inclusion. They're all let's, lies. Let's go real recent. The lie of uh, uh, Christian nationalism. You know, the biggest problem, according to the media here in America, is Christian nationalism. The Christians and Trump are going to take over our government and country and force everybody to uh, pray in school, go to church on Sunday. And Christian nationalism is, is slowly taking over our beautiful America. And I'm like, no, 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 no. When I step back and I look at what's taking over our schools, it's the rainbow flag. It's the drag uh, shows in libraries. It's completely different than Christian nationalism. Uh, the truth, not the lie, is that the, the, the queer agenda is taking over here in America and not Christian nationalism. And there's no such thing as Christian nationalism. The reason the forefathers of this country put together the Constitution they, the way they did is they looked at the history of all the countries that came from dictatorships and kings and monarchs and said, we don't want that. We can reshape it in a biblical form because we are cultural Christians as well as Richard Dawkins. We're going to take the, the morality we find in Scripture and apply it to the government we're making here in America in, in 1776. They weren't looking to be Christian nationalists, George. Bravo, Kevin. Good for you for saying that, because, you know, you're absolutely right. You get, uh, we live in adjacent counties, or you live part of the year in adjacent yes. counties. Yes, I do. <clears throat> Your county is older in terms of population, because I think you're the oldest county. We're Sutner the second County, oldest. yep. yep. But uh, here, Citrus County, we're the second or third oldest. But we hold the distinction of being the poorest county in Florida in terms of income, having the highest unemployment rate and being 97% white. So what, and when you drive around here and you see them too in Sumter County, Kevin, and when we went to that fish restaurant, we saw a few of these guys, the pickup trucks with the Confederate battle flags. Living in this part of the world, <laughs> ministering among the people like this, I don't think I've ever come across a Christian nationalist. Where are these Christian nationalists? I haven't seen any. Okay. I haven't experienced any. I don't, I'm <clears> sure <throat> there's some nut job somewhere deep in the woods. Fred Phelps. Uh, but you know, you know, but <laughs> it's another lie. You're yes. absolutely right, Kevin. It's a made up thing. And we now have, you know, the presiding bishop used to get hammer on about the problem of Christian nationalism. And I'm thinking, Where's this where? guy, you know, yeah. where, uh, you know, can you find one for me? Can you find one for me? I mean, yeah, you try and find, a I live in a part, we live in a part of the country where the Klan was actually a big thing up until the mid, late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. 
And if we can't find it here, we're not going to find it at well, Southern California. They're always going to be kooks. But if you can't find it here in this part of Florida, you can't find it anywhere. I know. And, you know, it's just one of those lies that, uh, you know, when you look at the reality and say, no, you're lying about Christian nationalism. Just take a look at the evidence. Every uh, um, kindergartner, middle school, high school uh, classroom has a rainbow, rainbow flag in it somewhere in, in our public school system. Maybe not in Florida, but boy, you go to California, you go to some of these more liberal places like New York and Pennsylvania and, and Philadelphia, of course they do. And we see that whenever they do an interview with these people. We see it when their, their teachers put their TikTok videos out. You know, uh, oh, I just got to talk to my, my, my kindergarten students today and explain uh, how my, my, uh, my wife, and this is a, a female teacher, it, it's just part of my life and what it means to be a lesbian and stuff like that. And I'm like, is that really appropriate for kindergarten? It's more of a middle school topic in my mind. But, you know, that's part of the lie, George. Kevin, I have never wanted to know about the sexual lives of any of my teachers. Never. I'm sorry. No. Okay. Now, I, maybe it's because I went to school with only boys and had all yeah. male teachers after the third grade, okay. but, you know. All right. 16 year old Kevin. I just don't Kevin, want to know this stuff. 16 year old Kevin had a crush on his English teacher, Mrs. Anderson. But other than that, I had no interest in, in understanding the sexuality preferences of any of my teachers. Nope. So, all right. We need to move on catch all these topics what's left here um you mentioned jamaica jamaica you and i went to kingston jamaica for the aac conference many years ago and that's where uh rowan williams and the leadership of the ac acc got caught trying to pull a fast one over the uh uh upcoming discussions of whether or not we should have a contract i mean not contract but a uh what's well, the word covenant Kevin. for the anglican communion they got caught and so we know about jamaica a little bit i remember the poverty i remember walking in downtown uh kingston and seeing just the absolute poverty so this story is kind of surprising to me but the west indian archbishop is calling for a republic let's leave the king of england behind george on Tuesday, the 153rd Synod of the Diocese of Jamaica met, and in his presidential address, marking 200 years of the Diocese of Jamaica and the establishment of the church in the West Indies, before that it was the Church of England, yep. the uh, Howard Gregory, the Archbishop, called upon the Jamaican government to fulfill its election promise and ditch Charles as king so that Jamaica becomes a republic. Stay in the Commonwealth, but get rid of all ties to the British monarchy and Britain uh, that it has as a constitutional monarchy, meaning we no longer have our Supreme Court, the Privy Council in London. We go to the Caribbean Court of Justice. We have, don't have the Queen or the King as the head of state. We have a president. Yeah. Inst uh, right now they have a prime minister and <clears throat> parliament and all that. And Part of the justification for this, Gregory said, is the legacy of slavery left by the British. And then he went on to say, and oh, by the way, the Church of England is going to give us 100 million pounds, and maybe we can get some money out of the government as well in reparations, because they owe it to us, because they brought us here as slaves. Now, the whole reparations, that's another whole day of itself to talk about. <laughs> We've discussed We're going to that pay reparations. Let's start with the Jews who've yes. been, you know, victimized yeah. for two thousand years. But you know, when you know, when Justin Welby makes these dumb PC statements about, you know, apologies and reparations, there's some people who are gonna believe them and expect. So, you know, there are gonna be people in Jamaica in the churches who are thinking, oh, well, our roof is going to get fixed because by the church commissioners in London. Oh, we're going to get new pew. In other words, these promises, which I don't think will ever be fulfilled because it's been a year since they talked about doing this and they've not, not done a single thing and not a single penny has gone in reparations. Um, it's just going to piss people off. It, well, to, so it's virtue signaling. 
well, hold on. Let's let's get you know our opinions here. You know, I don't care whether or not Jamaica wants to leave the monarchy and form their own republic or uh, their own government. I, they're free to do so. Um, but to think that they're going to get paid reparations uh, as a reason to do this, I think that's ridiculous. There's no money in the Church of England to do it, and anytime they talk about it, it's another you know Justin Welby wink wink nod nod. Of course, I'm going to meet with the victims of sexual abuse. Wink, wink, nod, nod. So, well, see, it's so much easier to meet with the uh, descendants of slaves because you really don't have to do anything. Whereas the victims of sexual abuse, you were part of the cover up where you actually can be personally held to account. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier to, to apologize for other people's sins rather than face your own. Boy, that's kind of ironic. And uh, a teaching moment there, George, at the same time. Good job. Okay, we're still raising funds to send George to La Trobe for the ACNA provincial uh, meeting coming up in June. Uh, if you want to go to anglican.inc forward slash donate, click that PayPal button and help us out. Uh, you were also yeah. raising money for something else, but I don't know if we have the funds to do it. I got maybe... Yeah, you know, a little bit. What 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 do you what do you want to raise funds for, George? I need about two thousand oh, dollars. I've been invited. <laughs> well, Kevin, if we got two hundred people giving us ten bucks, okay, twenty yeah, sure. people giving us a hundred bucks. Yeah, you know this video will be seen by four or five thousand people. Yeah. Um, if if one in fifty gives us you know some money, yeah. well, I've been invited to the Global South uh, Primates meeting. Um, only a handful of reporters have been invited. It's being held at a monastery between Cairo and Alexandria. And the problem is the flight to get to Cairo from uh, Florida is about $1,500. And I need about 500 to pay the accommodation and get from here to there and all that. And I think this might be something. Uh, we've been to international meetings with bu that were busts. But we've also been to meetings that really have changed the church, like when we went to Tanzania yeah. at that time. That was important that we were there. When we were in Jamaica, that was important. And so if uh, if you, our viewers, if you can get me there, um, I really think we can do something special because we are reaching a point in the Anglican world where things are going to move. And this meeting may be one of those points. Flashpoints. And we saw that flashpoint last year when GAFCON had GAFCON 4, and they said, we're no longer being going to be the political uh, movement of Anglicanism. We're going to be the feet on the ground, and the Global South is going to take over the politics. And to be able to send George to a, a Global South meeting would be great. Yeah, Kevin, I'm thinking out loud, you know, can people donate air miles? No, <laughs> no, they, it, that doesn't work. But uh, maybe some, if you are able to, uh, give us a call. But you have to, you have to. What? Why don't you find out what airline is best and stuff like that? Send me the details, and if somebody from that airline can donate air miles, that'd be great as well. Um, but we shall work out because I'm flying to uh, Philadelphia at the end of May to attend um, a Dyson convention. And you're flying to La Trobe, and then you're going to try and fly all the way out to Egypt. So we do need to raise some money uh, if you're able to. Hey, that's 59 minutes, George. That's the end of the show. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 849 of Anglican Unscripted.